Abby. Get all your belongings. Grab your towels. Grab your swim. What are you going to miss about Summer Adventure Club? All the friends I met and all the things that we learned about. Hey, Carlos, what's one thing you're going to miss about Summer Adventure Club? Um, the adventures. Awesome. What are you going to miss about Summer Adventure Club? No, I'm really missing friends. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. What's one thing you learned about team building at Summer Adventure Club? So, one thing I learned about team building is that, uh, so we have various leaders in our team, and we all, like, if we need help with something, we ask each other, we ask around and see, if um, this person can do the job better at this moment and um, always just check in with each other and see like how everything's running smoothly and yeah. Thank you for sharing. What was one of the things you learned about the kids at Summer Adventure Club? Yeah, one of the things I learned about the kids is that they all have different talents and different gifts and it really does reflect when we're doing crafts and games and some of them have already leadership skills developed and so um, it's been really good to see them and like flourish in that throughout the program. You learned about yourself during Summer Adventure Club. Yeah, one thing I learned about myself is that I normally am the person that takes orders and like just does whatever, like a uh, above leader tells me what to do, but this time I realized that, wow, now I'm the leader and now I can take initiative and, um, and plan some things as well. So that's kind of one thing I learned about myself and how to build that skill. Question. What was one thing you learned about team building? Um, that it's okay to lean on your, on your, your team. It's okay to uh, be vulnerable and lean, lean on your team whenever you need help. It, it's good to ask questions. Yeah. Thank you, Xavier, for sharing. What was one thing that you learned about yourself during Summer Adventure Club? One thing that I learned about myself really is that I'm able to, to lead. I'm able to lead with a group of good leaders. So. What was one thing you learned about the kids at Summer Adventure Club? Um, for Summer Adventure Club, the kids, I really learned that they all come with their own different personalities, you know? So you got to deal with one that's maybe happy one day, upset the other day. What was one thing you learned about the states you travel at Summer Adventure Club? Uh, one thing I learned about Hawaii is that they might have a new island coming up. It's still below the water. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Jezreel, what are you going to miss about Summer Adventure Club? The staff and the students. Thank you, Jezreel. I appreciate that. Sorry, what was one of the things you learned about the states we traveled? Um, that Hawaii was, became a state back in 1959. What was one of the field trips you liked about Summer Adventure Club? What did you like about Chevrolet? Because we went, we got to go, I think it was skiing, skiing something, I don't know, but we went in a little thing and they pulled us in the water. That's awesome. What was your favorite field trip at Summer Adventure Club? Right now. Hawaii? Oh. And last question. What will you miss most about Summer Adventure Club? Um, most I would miss um, is the leaders and all the new friends I made this summer and yeah. Hey, thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Last question, James. What are you going to miss about Summer Adventure Club? Spending time with my friends in my life. Cry, for they will be Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you. Ooh! Hey! What is it? Hey! All right, guys. So, how does it feel to be the champion?
continue to swim. And I don't hold the day. Many years later, understand what happened. One of my brothers. The peace of the Lord be with you. My name is Cheryl and I'm one of the pastors here at North Fresno Church. We want to extend a warm welcome to any of you who might be new this morning. And I know there are at least four new people who will be worshiping with us this morning because the new Micah Project interns have moved in this weekend and they will be joining us in worship this morning. We welcome others who also might be new and um, invite you to look at our website at northfresnochurch.org to learn more about our ministries and how to get connected. This morning we will be hearing from our global partners in ministry and Pastor Brian will be bringing the sermon to us. As usual, he'll be interacting with people in the Facebook chat and we will have our Zoom meeting after uh, the service this morning at 11 o'clock for a time of prayer and fellowship. The link to that was sent in our Friday newsletter. We are grateful for your ongoing generosity to our church and the ministries of North Fresno Church. We have several options for giving in this time where we are gathering online instead of in person. And if you need some help setting up a recurring donation online, feel free to contact us at the church office and we will be happy to provide you with some help. For our call to worship this morning, I want to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. These verses remind us of who we are as followers of Christ and also of all that God has done for us. May our hearts rejoice that we have received mercy and are God's people. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks and praise this morning for your steadfast goodness and faithfulness, for your grace and for your love. Thank you for reaching out to us and calling us your own, for giving us a place of belonging and a new family, the body of Christ. May your love flow through us to all that we encounter, cherishing each person as made in the image of God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit afresh so that we may be renewed and readied for all that you call us to. Be glorified as we turn our hearts to you and praise your name. Amen. Oh, praise God's name together, you servant of the Speak. 
in Lisbon, Portugal. And just like the rest of you folks, we have to wear masks wherever we go. To the grocery store, when we leave the house, we have to put on masks. We have also been really struggling with this virus. Our churches have been um, on Zoom. And when we go outside and meet people, we have to social distance. And it's been a real struggle and we are really sensing as this progresses, the frustration in people around us. Yes, uh, and I think it would be good for you to know that some of our people have had the virus uh -huh. uh, uh, and they've had to uh, quarantine for at least two weeks. Uh, some of them are coming out just now and finally recuperating. So it's uh, good news in that sense. Mm -hmm. And just like you, uh, churches are trying all kinds of things. Uh, our churches here have been on Zoom and on YouTube and all kinds of other ways of trying to meet and trying to get together. As a matter of fact, one of our churches during the early days of the more severe pandemic here uh, for two months was uh, had a Bible study on Zoom every evening for two months in a row. And uh, one of the things, one of the realities is that the pastor told me just a few days ago is that the church members have really grown during those days. Uh, we have been very busy in those days with our, so, during, with our social ministries in various areas. For instance, like Marjorie is working with the secondhand store. I have been at the, at the co-work space where we have quite a few clients these days. Because one of the things is during the pandemic, uh, you want to be in a cubicle, you want to be secure. And so uh, the idea of having smaller offices and smaller cubicles uh, is really in high demand. And so we have around 50, 60 clients right now that are asking us to, uh, whether we can have, uh, whether they can use our space. So it's been a, just a great time, a great experience to do this. And we just uh, ask you to continue to pray for this uh, co-work space in a very special way. And also, Margie, we'd like to share a little bit about the secondhand store. Yes, during the beginning months of the pandemic, we were closed for about six weeks. And we were, we had, were reorganizing and we were doing a lot of praying during that time. Our team of, of four uh, ladies from our churches and we were praying that God would give us many opportunities when we were able to open the doors again. Well, we have just been surprised. Once we started opening the doors, the ladies and the people of the community have been coming in. We have had sales better than we've ever had, really. And the opportunities to share the hope that we have with people. It is just like people were desperate to come and visit with us and talk with us. And um, it's just been a real good experience since we've been open. So pray that we can stay healthy. Pray that our workers in our store stay healthy. We're using masks. We're using um, hand sanitizer. During the beginning months, I made over a hundred of these masks to give away in our store, in the people in our churches. And so we're trying to use different opportunities to reach out to people. So we just really want to thank you for sta standing by us and standing with us during these days. Uh, and we just really feel blessed that North Fresno is right there with us. Thank you again so much and many blessings. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. Good evening. 
Greetings from Portugal, from our church family and also from our family. We are together here, Marques, Eliane in the middle, and Elisa and Selma are there. Hola! So it's it's Hola. very, very good Hola. to talk to you. We are doing this very spontaneous video just to let you know that we're doing fine. Thank God our churches have been surviving too. Uh, we are doing doing our ministries much more on uh, uh, digital networks nowadays. Although we have our present or presence uh, services too, uh, the government allowed us to to restart. But we have to be wearing our masks uh, wherever we go and in in a church too. So we're using both ways, and we've seen uh, very much benefits of uh, using more and more digital tools because uh, yeah we've been aware of um, meeting with people that usually we don't and we've been reaching people that usually we don't reach we have some people that have been talking to us and, and sharing their uh, testimonies uh, that usually don't do it or people that usually don't go to the church so this has been very positive we had to learn much more uh, about uh, different dimensions of the church. Uh, we feel that we are much more independent of this, the church facilities. We believe that church is not uh, the facility. So uh, thank God everyone is very encouraged. Everyone is very committed. Um, and we've seen the power of the word of God on that uh, through the Bible studies that we've been doing. Uh, seeing how the Word of God is motivating and encouraging people even in, in difficult times like this. And it's good to see that everyone is mentally healthy. Uh, we are also aware of the social needs that we're having now. Uh, there are the best uh, companies in Portugal are having problems and, and troubles. Many people are losing their jobs. Uh, but thank God in our churches we didn't lose um, jobs so much as far as I remember. Um, maybe one case. Um, and we want to restart again our social services, our, our social ministries that we had to stop during the beginning of the pandemic. We are restarting our bazaars in um, the beginning of August. The bazaars are the social ministry that we do with clothes. We want to restart that. And we are in the process of developing a project for a second-hand store for Lourdes. Uh, it won't be on, only, only a store, but uh, it will be more a community center, a place for people to be. And uh, we will have different services and different activities going on. And we, are, we have the model, we have the project, we have people available to work there. But we are still fundraising because we need to reach... Uh, the goal on the budget that we uh, defined so we keep um, we're still fundraising for that and uh, we ask you to pray for us in that process too so thank god everything is doing well we are trying to adjust like just like you're doing and so far things are going very well and um, yeah we want to continue and uh, continue especially focalizing more on um, small groups instead of doing things with lot with big groups just to let you know that we feel that one we are one family and that uh, we depend on each other we want to continue to pray for you for your challenges difficulties um, and uh, don't feel alone we are one and we're facing all this together blessings from our lord to all of you bye bye Thank you. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see. 
Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine, content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me. Genuine kindness, a neighborhood focus, avoiding ideology. These are three of the unique strengths that you have at the North Fresno Church. Yes, that phrase was for you, Aaron Weens, the North Fresno Church. Think of it as a phrase of affection, like the Ohio State University. These strengths of yours are part of what I miss about being together with you physically. I miss experiencing God's love through your kindness. I miss sitting down over a cup of coffee and hearing all that you are doing in the city of Fresno. All of this within a community that is avoiding some of the divisions that are plaguing our society as a whole. Thank you for being you. When I interviewed for my current job at the Fresno Pacific Biblical Seminary six years ago, there are two things in particular I remember as my, my wife Stephanie and I flew across country from eastern Pennsylvania to here in central California. The first was almost physically running into Harrison Ford at LAX. I mean, literally, he walked this close in front of me. And yes, he does appear to be a man in his 70s, and he's a little bit shorter than I expected him to be. But the second thing I remember is being asked by the, by the faculty my impression of the seminary. And being a man of subtleties, <laughs> I just went right at it. I said, you have the right kingdom theology and values. Your vision of Jesus is perfect. But you don't know how to package it for people outside of these walls to care about it. My now very good friend and colleague, Dr. Adam Galley, uh, later told me that he said to the faculty after I was gone, I don't know that I like Brian, but I think he's probably right. When I interviewed for this wonderful role, serving as an interim teaching pastor at NFC with the Spiritual Life Committee, I decided to take a similar tact. I was just going to be very honest about where I was with NFC. And I shared all that I respected about the church, all of your strengths that I've mentioned here. And of course, I talked about the wonderful pastor, James Bergen, uh, someone who I have so much respect for, who has people skills that I wish that I had, who has people skills that other people wish that I had. I think when you look at pastor in Webster's Dictionary, you see a picture of James Bergen. But I also shared with the committee why I was not a member at NFC. And I said, as much as I respect the congregation, I don't think I could bring a normal person here. And what I mean by that is someone, you know, a neighbor, a friend, an acquaintance who did not grow up in the church. I said, I don't think they would connect here. And that is a strong value that I personally have. You know, my mom always said that if, if you're going to give someone a suggestion, you need to give them three compliments. And that is what I've tried to do. And I, and I believe them sincerely. As, a, as an outsider to North Fresno Church, but as someone who cares about you, this is what I've seen in my time with you. Genuine kindness, 
and neighborhood focus, avoiding ideology, these are your unique strengths and what you have to offer people here in the Fresno area. However, I also want to mention what I think is a weakness as someone who cares. You are a wonderful community for ethnic Mennonites. However, you may not naturally connect with people who need Jesus, but who know very little about him or his vision for life. For a very specific kind of person, you are a wonderful community. But for the increasing number of people who have difficult lives and need Jesus, but don't have a Christian background, I'm not sure that they would connect here. I want to read a section from St. Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. Paul writes, Although I'm free from all people, I make myself a slave to all people to recruit more of them. I act like a Jew to the Jews so I can recruit Jews. I act like I'm under the law to those under the law so I can recruit those who are under the law, though I myself am not under the law. I act like I'm outside the law to those who are outside the law so I can recruit those outside the law though I'm not outside the law of God, but rather under the law of Christ. I act weak to the weak, so I can recruit the weak. I have become all things to all people, so I could save some by all possible means. All the things I do are for the sake of the gospel, so I can be a partner with it. The Apostle Paul here uses some some strong language. And my guess is his intention was to shock some of us even a couple of millennia later. I mean, look again at some of the statements he uses. I make myself a slave to all people to recruit more of them. I act like a Jew to the Jews so I can recruit Jews. I act like I'm outside the law to those who are outside the law so I can recruit those outside the law. I act weak to the weak so I can recruit the weak. I have become all things to all people so I could save some by all possible means. It seems to me that Paul is saying something like, I give up all of my cultural preferences and rights in order to build connections with people who need to find life with Jesus as Lord. I give up everything I like to, like to build those relationships with people. I will act like a Jewish person, or I will conduct myself like a Gentile. I will take on any pattern needed to connect with people so that they can connect with our God through Christ. How do you react to that? What if the North Fresno Church could be used by the Spirit to help people with complex and difficult lives find a new kind of life, a new kind of hope, a new way of being with their Creator? But to do that would require giving up some of the ways that you have always done church. Giving up some of your preferences of how this community operates together. Would you be willing to do that? Now, I'm sure at least a couple of you are, are pushing back on me a little bit. And you say... Are we really supposed to be like the world? Isn't the kingdom of God something different? A place where we emphasize Jesus and community and reconciliation and justice. And I would say, yes, of course. This is the gift that you have to offer others. 
These are values and visions and narratives of life that people need. I completely agree with you on that. But how do you offer them to people who haven't really been a part of a church before? To people who know almost nothing about the Bible? To people who have never heard your songs, never sung them before? To people who grew up playing Xbox and watching Quentin Tarantino films and listening to songs put out by Def Jam Records and not growing up at church camp. Clearly, church is boring and pointless if we simply tell people what they want to hear or if we affirm all of the values they already have. Church and spiritual community is pointless if people are not finding some kind of challenge to become different kinds of people. I fully agree with you on that. But you also have to keep in mind that most people today do not know what you know. They have not experienced what you have experienced. They don't presently hold the values that you do. So what would it mean for NFC to become all things to all people so that you could save some by all possible means. Because our world is changing, friends. Look, 53% of adults in the United States have read less than half the Bible. They're not terribly familiar with it. One in four, and this is increasing, have never read any of the Bible, or they've said at most they've read a couple of sentences. One in three, and this is certainly growing, particularly with young adults, say that the Bible is a dangerous book and should not be a trusted guide for life. And of course, most Americans believe that churches already have too much influence on society, and they should be less influential. Here is a headline that the uh, Pew Research Group put out last year in October of 2019. In U.S., decline of Christianity continues at a rapid pace. The Gallup organization did a uh, decade in review from 2010 to 2019, and they highlighted some of the tremendous changes that have taken place in American culture. Here was one of their highlights. Church membership and attendance, as well as frequency of attendance, are all down to record lows. Americans have become less likely to believe in God. Some of you are old enough that you remember if a man and woman lived together that you could safely assume that they were married. And you may have learned over the years, maybe painfully, that that's not helpful socially anymore to assume that if a couple live together, they're married. They very well may not be. Some of you remember a time that you could assume a young single man was naturally attracted to young single women and vice versa. But you may have learned it's not helpful to assume anymore that everyone is straight. If you want to build connections with people, you can't make those assumptions any longer. But as our culture continues to change, you see, this is what we do. We have to let go of our assumptions to build relationships, to build connections with other people. And if the North Fresno Church is going to be on mission with the Spirit of Jesus, we can't assume that the people who watch these worship videos or who show up at a small group in someone's backyard are Christian or are familiar with the Bible or identify with Mennonite values. We can no longer assume these things if we want to connect with people and help them find life with the risen Christ. Obviously, I am a middle-aged 
white Anabaptist minister. Well, I, I take that back. I'm a early middle-aged white Anabaptist minister. But I have to admit, there have been plenty of gatherings this past year at NFC where I did not feel like I really fit. And I am quite similar to you in so many ways. Now, again, I want to be clear. Everyone has been incredibly kind to me. I have enjoyed my time with you. This is a strength. I've, I've felt cared for. But it's clear that I come from a different place than many of you. I grew up watching Three's Company as a kid, not attending PDC youth camps. I get excited about the Ohio State University football games and not annual MCC events. Familiar names that I know are characters on Netflix serial dramas and not common Mennonite last names. Now again, is there something wrong with your heritage? Of course not. You do not need to apologize for who you are. You are blessed in so many ways. Many people would have been better off having the, the cultural heritage in some ways that you have had. But if you want to partner with the gospel, you have to remember that most people will not connect with some of your background. They have zero ties to it. And this should matter to you. Let me just by way of illustration and just my observations kind of describe some of the differences that I think may go on within people. These are, in my opinion, from observation, some common Anabaptist or Mennonite questions. How do we make it clear that we are different than megachurch evangelicals? Anabaptists tend to see themselves as a renewal movement within the church, so they often compare and contrast themselves with kind of dominant Christians. Number two, how do we make sure that all of our church members have a voice in our major decisions? Strong value of community. Uh, and then number three, how do we keep each other informed about what is happening with the members of our church family? Again, these are all good things. But I think they're very different questions than the typical normal, if you will, um, unchurched American may consider. These are more common normal people questions. How can I be free to be who I am meant to be when everyone is pushing their agenda on me? That might be the dominant narrative for people right now in the United States. Number two, how can I find hope and a better life when the economy is teetering and politics seem ridiculous? My relationships are complicated and I have habits that I cannot seem to overcome. Real common questions for the average person. Number three, how can an ancient religion and an ancient religious book offer me anything of value today? Now, again, I want to be clear. I think NFC could offer some real life-changing responses to these types of questions. But you have to notice that they are different from one's of, of people who have grown up for generations in a Mennonite church. And you have to intentionally be addressing these kinds of questions that people are asking themselves on the street. Now, I want to personally offer just a, a couple of suggestions for you as a church. And again, they're just my opinion. They certainly don't come from Mount Sinai. But as someone who cares about you and cares about your future, just a, a couple of suggestions for you to consider. Number one, in everything that the church does, always assume that there are people present who are not following Jesus and who know almost nothing about him. If you assume there are always outsiders present who know nothing about the Bible and this is new, this alone will almost change everything that you do. Now again, I don't mean watering things down. If people are taking the time to check out a church today, 
They are looking for something real, something with substance. I don't mean something light. I mean, give people real spiritual meat. But you can't assume that they already agree with you or that they even know that you're talking about. The key is to offer something spiritually substantive, but for people that all of this is new for them. Number two, track if people from outside the church are finding a personal connection with Jesus or not at NFC. I mean, literally log this. How many people who are outside of a church are connecting with us in some way? And what is going on with them? Are they finding life change? And if not, why not? I think it's a really helpful question to ask. And then number three, experiment with offering people different kinds of spiritual experiences. You know, ethnic Mennonites tend to be very measured people that are, that are thoughtful and private. And again, that's fine and good. There's nothing wrong with that. But lots of contemporary Americans are more expressive, more emotive, more sensual in some ways, um, more psychologically honest and vulnerable about what is going on with them personally. And so to connect with people is not to simply agree with them politically or on certain social values, but it comes down to doing life together in a way that resonates with people. Because nothing that we do is neutral, culturally. Um, the, the genre of music that we sing together, the illustrations that a preacher uses, the way that we pray or don't pray, uh, the way that we express our emotions or hold them back, all of these are sending signals about what kind of culture we are around here. And if the church wants to connect with more people, wants to be a partner with the Spirit where other people can find life change with the vision and teaching of Jesus, you may need to experiment with some different ways of being together. You know, the, uh, the renowned Yale theologian Willie Jennings uh, a couple of years ago, wrote a, a book on the biblical book of Acts. And that is the story of how the Spirit of God worked through the first followers of Jesus in the early church. Listen to what he says. He says, in the book of Acts, almost no one is doing what they want to do. Everyone is being pressed by the Spirit to do what they prefer not to do. And most centrally, the Spirit is pressing them to go be with people they prefer not to be with. And he takes it further, kind of uh, compares the early church and what the Spirit is doing to contemporary people. He says, the difficulty is that Christians have wanted to avoid precisely the possibility that they would have to live a Christian life out of control. Again, everyone is being pressed by the Spirit to do what they prefer not to do. The Spirit is pressing them to go be with people they prefer not to be with. The possibility of living a Christian life out of control. And then again, the words of St. Paul, I have become all things to all people so I could save some by all possible means. So, who or what are you willing to become for the sake of the gospel, North Fresno Church? Lord, again, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. I thank you for their unique strengths. I thank you for the amazing community that NFC is. A group of brothers and sisters who drip with kindness, who love to serve the poor in their neighborhoods, who seek to be above the ID 
ideological divisions in our culture. And I pray that they would search their hearts and consider being open to your spirit to experiment with what it might look like to be this kind of community with these kind of gifts, but for people that do not have the same background in history that they do. Lord, they have so many wonderful things to offer. May they help build bridges for other people to find you and your freedom through the ministry at the North Fresno Church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. to him.